Uh, we've been talking about uh, the prospect of opening for, for several weeks, obviously. And, and part of the thinking has been areas where there's uh, dense gathering, movie theaters, churches, uh, sports venues, would come last. They're now in phase one. Can you talk about how, uh, the, how, what kind of thinking went behind that? Well, I, th this, as the president laid out yesterday, and as uh, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Fauci and Dr. Birx did as well, is the product of very careful consideration uh, by uh, the medical advisors uh, to the president, uh, and uh, I think reflects a uh, thoughtful uh, and appropriately cautious approach, but one which recognizes that uh, <laughs> some states uh, very soon, if not now, are in a position where they can uh, begin to reopen. Uh, with respect to the kind of public pet places that you're mentioning, uh, it's not going to be wide open right away. That, that's, that's phase three. Uh, but I think in consultation with the experts here, we're finding that we, uh, in a number of states, and they'll make those decisions themselves, but it looks like a number of states will begin to uh, begin this, this reopening soon. We need to continue to be disciplined about the guidance for public health that's laid out in this document. We have to be disciplined. But this is, this is a sign we're turning the corner uh, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. How much uh, did testing play in the creation of these guidelines? People are pointing to, say, Virginia uh, this morning. State has 8.5 million people. Uh, tests so far, 50,000. Uh, to what degree will testing be a true barometer of the degree to which they can reopen? Well, it's in the document itself. The, uh, it, it, the test results, symptoms and cases are... Uh, going to be a, uh, an important measure of whether uh, states and the judgment of the governors are a, ready to pass through uh, another gate. So that's, that's certainly something that's going to be looked at. But again, when I look at this from an economic perspective, I think the uh, uh, announcement yesterday is very good news. It shows a thoughtful, uh, measured approach, but one which uh, shows the way out of this. And we've heard, I think, already from some governors who feel that they're prepared to go there, and, uh, and, and you, you were talking a moment ago about the unemployment numbers that we released yesterday. Obviously, uh, the sacrifice that the American workers are making is, is tough and it's hard to see. But we're, we're seeing results, too. And so we're, we're grateful for the discipline. Uh, we realize there needs to be more. Uh, but but we're, we're seeing, again, uh, a, a way out of this, a way forward. And I think uh, that's a, a reason for optimism at this point. Uh, is there, um, you didn't really lay this out, but is there an expectation of which states you would imagine would be most aggressive here? I don't know if that's uh, part of the, the matrix uh, or whether or not you're really trying to leave that to governors. But you must have a sense politically of uh, which governors are really champing at the bit. Well, I don't, I don't think we're uh, looking for people to be uh, overly aggressive. I, I think one of the uh, important messages yesterday is that this is a, a, a thoughtful uh, data-driven, scientifically informed approach. And again, different governors can make different decisions. And I don't want to uh, uh, pre-announce that for them. But I, I believe that some governors already have begun to signal they think they're close uh, and can uh, enter into phase one. And, and they'll make those decisions and move forward. But I think it's, it's good news for the national economy as a whole that we, we have this roadmap now. And uh, it seems to be reflected in the stock market this morning. Secretary Scalia, it's Sarah Eisen. You know, there are so many Americans right now that are risking their lives to take care of critically ill patients in hospitals, to make sure we have groceries on our shelves, to make sure the streets are safe. What at the Department of Labor are you doing to protect them and make sure their employers follow the CDC guidelines and provide them with the necessary equipment that they need? Well, uh, you know, Sarah, as you say, I mean, uh, this is a, a war of sorts. And, and the front line in this war is different than in the past. It includes uh, our health care workers who are doing amazing things right now and, and right, are, are making some sacrifices and, and, and taking some risks. Obviously, uh, getting equipment to them has been very important. It's something the president has moved on uh, very quickly. Uh, we at the Department of Labor have been working with the CDC uh, to make sure that uh, the right information, the right guidance is being provided to uh, to those companies uh, so that they can take care of their workers. Uh, we uh, at the department are also uh, receiving and, and looking into uh, complaints when we have them. And uh, something that I've certainly emphasized and will continue to emphasize is that uh, workers who have concerns have a right to raise them with their, uh, with their company. And if they feel they've been uh, discriminated against or retaliated because 
they raised health concerns, then we at the Labor Department want to know about that. Why, why have you not been more aggressive to publicize those complaints, to issue citations? A lot of people wondering why you're not using OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, to do more to protect workers, and why we're starting to see things like strikes and, and more publicity around Amazon work, warehouse workers and, and other sort of complaints by workers that they're not getting what they need. We are doing more. Uh, OSHA was putting out guidance uh, on uh, precautions to take in the workplace as early as January. I think January 22nd was the first time that they began putting out guidance. They've been uh, doing that regularly. They've also taken steps to help free up the supply of respirators to healthcare workers. Uh, they are receiving complaints. It's not OSHA's practice to announce complaints when they're received, but we're receiving them. We're looking into them. Uh, we are uh, contacting companies where there are concerns. We've seen some results. And uh, so they are uh, very much uh, engaged now, and I'm in regular communication with them about the uh, steps that are being taken, both to uh, work with CDC to ensure worker safety and also to uh, protect their ability to step forward if they have concerns. Secretary Scalia, it's David Faber. Uh, given the unprecedented number who, of people who find themselves out of work, it's no surprise that states may be overwhelmed with phone calls and applications. Uh, many have turned to the federal government to say, hey, help us out on the administration of these benefits. Are you doing that or are you telling them it's your problem to deal with? We're working so closely with the states. Uh, when we look for, I think, bright spots, good news and what the country is dealing with right now, one is certainly uh, all of the quick steps the president Congress took last month, three major pieces of legislation in three weeks, including that unprecedented uh, uh, unemployment insurance uh, payment was, that was put into the uh, the CARES Act, $600 a week additional on top of what the states provide. Now, unemployment insurance is a state-run system, but we have a billion dollars that we are giving out to help them with those systems. Uh, uh, I think about two-thirds of the states are now making those payments, that additional $600, and we're in constant contact with them, even providing them extra resources to help them with their computer systems, which in some cases are decades old, old. We're working with them, giving them additional resources. We, we want to help them succeed in, in getting these payments out to workers. Obviously, uh, something else that's been very important to us is the Paycheck Protection Program, which was another really uh, valuable part of the, the CARES Act. It kept workers on payroll. It kept small businesses uh, up. And sadly, uh, that's now out of funds. Uh, I, I'm sad uh, to, to hear that because I thought it was such a good thing for workers but, uh, but unfortunately, the Democratic leadership is not allowing us to go forward right now with replenishing that program. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of the Democratic leadership, I know as well you did get a letter from a number of senators yesterday uh, saying that the Labor Department's guidance for dispersing the jobless benefits, quotes, appears narrow or ambiguous, which could make states think they need to exclude workers who Congress clearly intended to receive unemployment compensation through the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Are you working to clarify any of this guidance, perhaps, that may be ambiguous, at least according to a number of senators? Uh, we put out uh, all the essential guidance the states needed to implement these unemployment programs uh, within about eight days, nine days of the CARES Act being passed. So we moved very quickly and, uh, and actually uh, expanded what Congress did. You know, uh, the CARES Act, as was passed by Congress, uh, didn't by its terms, extend unemployment benefits to an Uber driver who uh, was not able to uh, serve customers because of a shutdown uh, by, the, uh, by the city or the state or, or just because the customers weren't there. But uh, I had authority in the statute, which I used, to make it clear that benefits could be available there, too. That's, a number, uh, that's one of a number of points that uh, we'll clarify to those senators. I've been in touch with them, and I think we have a, actually a very good story to tell about how closely and quickly we've been working with the states to help them deal with uh, this new program, an important program, and also a, a really high volume of claims that they're experiencing right now. Finally, Mr. Secretary, you, you mentioned Uber. We've had some um, investors come on our air recently and complain about uh, gig economy companies like Uber who, because they kept employees as independent contractors, never paid into the unemployment pool. And as a result, we are now all paying for those drivers uh, who are trying to collect claims. Uh, is the, are, are both political parties going to take a hard look at that in the, uh, in the day, uh, years to come? 
Well, as I said, uh, the uh, gig economy workers, independent contractors are covered by the uh, unemployment benefit program that was established by the president and Congress in the CARES Act. They are uh, also entitled to that $600 a week unemployment compensation payment, which is, uh, which is a generous one, uh, much larger than most states pay, but which the president thought was important to uh, make Americans whole who are uh, making such a sacrifice as we uh, try to beat back the virus.